All righty. Well, welcome back, everyone, to BizBuzz Week 6 meeting. I'm your president, Colin Flintoft. I hope midterms have been treating everyone pretty well. And uh, we're pumped today to have you join us to hear from guest speaker Jacob Ullman from Fox Sports. Thanks for joining us, Jacob. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We had to host someone from across the town, as we'll dive into a little bit more. But uh, yeah, we're pumped to have you. So before diving into everything, just real quick, going over a bit of an agenda, I'm going to introduce Jacob. He's then going to share a little bit about his path to success. Then we'll lead a little bit of a discussion featuring our executive board. And then towards the end, we'll allow for 15 or so minutes of uh, open audience question and answer. I'll be moderating that. We just ask that during that time, you use the raise hand function or feel free to type in uh, to the chat, just any questions that may come up uh, throughout the entire meeting. And then at the end, we'll briefly touch on what our next play looks like, as well as some announcements. So who is Jacob? Jacob is currently the Senior Vice President of Production and Talent Development over at Fox Sports. He did go to USC, which albeit not being a Bruin, yes, that's unfortunate. Still a very good school, obviously. Uh, while there, in my, in my defense, there is no broadcast journalism department at UCLA. That's a very good point. And uh, hopefully everyone on this call, we can, in the next, you know, whoever knows how long, try and figure out a way to get that to happen. That's for sure. Um, he also, while there, got a minor in sports media studies, which, again, is something we unfortunately do not have over here yet. Uh, while being a student at USC, he also worked in the athletic department and then also did some stuff for his student radio station calling football and basketball games. And looking a little bit at his professional career, he primarily works on NFL, NASCAR, and WWE productions. And he's actually been at Fox Sports throughout his entire career, where he started as an intern and then worked his way up to being a production assistant, researcher, director, producer, vice president, and most recently, senior vice president. So all in all, really awesome, impressive resume. We're very lucky to have Jacob with us tonight. And with that in mind, Jacob, would you mind sharing with us a little more about your story and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, um, I, you know, when when uh, you ask, you know, a young kid, what do you want to do? And, and the line is, oh, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a firefighter. I actually said I want to be a baseball play by play announcer. It was kind of from as, as early as I knew what, I, you know, people would ask you that question. That was that was kind of my answer. And I just sports was always my passion growing up. I would call. I turn the sound off on the TV and 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 announce it myself. And um, I was I was lucky enough to end up where I went, where uh, you know it had a great department for broadcasting, and um, there was a great student radio station where I could call the football games and the basketball games. And um, I got great on honestly on the job training in school, and and it and it really uh, put me in a good position to succeed. Um, and then once I graduated, I, you know, I was like, I had, I was already kind of had got my foot in the door at, at Fox. I started working there when I was in school and I said, well, let me give this a year and, and see how it goes before I move, you know, somewhere across the country to be a broadcaster, gave it another year. And then finally we had a Super Bowl, my third year at work. And it was like, as good of a broadcaster as I could ever become, chance of me working a Super Bowl, you know, there, there's only X amount of those jobs in the world. And then I kind of just accepted that, hey, I want to be more, you know, behind the scenes. And um, yeah, yeah, now bizarrely, I hire the people that want to be broadcasters as opposed to being one myself. So um, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate, very privileged. Uh, I, you know, we, we I, obviously last night, our company finished broadcasting the World Series. We broadcast Super Bowls, Daytona 500s, World Cups. Uh, we just announced a deal where we're going to be signing uh, for the soccer fans out there, the European Championships we'll be doing. Um, I, I think Fox is very unique in the sense that we do the biggest events at the highest level. Um, uh, you know, our competitors, ESPN, I think, do more sports. Um, they, uh, if you think, you know, during the day, you want to see what's going on in sports, you may turn on sports center and that's how you get your updates or be it, you know, online on their, on their feed. But I think what we do the best is doing major events like the Super Bowl and the world series. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that introduction. That's really cool. And also considering back in the day, you wanted to be like a play-by-play -play announcer from such a young age. 
that was still while things were like ESPN and Fox Sports were kind of just coming into existence, right? Could you maybe talk us through what that looked like and, you know, just how far they've come since? Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely a different time. You know, there was, uh, you know, the internet was literally just starting when I was finishing college. Uh, the, the, if you were an aspiring broadcaster, what you do is you'd graduate, you'd move to a small city and work in local news, then hopefully go to a medium city, then hopefully go to a larger city, and then hopefully, if it all worked out, you'd end up in network TV. Um, for anybody that's on here that is an aspiring broadcaster, you know, now you have so many more opportunities. There are digital opportunities. There's uh, regional sports networks. Uh, you can create your own podcast. You can create your own YouTube channel. You can create your own videos on Instagram. There are so many more opportunities to get involved in the field than there was then where it was, uh, you know, uh, not even everybody had cable TV, much less, you know, there was nothing digital and no social media. So um, we've come a long way and in, in honestly in a relatively short amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. And there was no such thing as like a 24 hour sports station too right like uh what espn had started espn started so espn was kind of the only thing like that um and but i think what would happen honestly is you know there'd be a um we'll call it an 8 p.m pacific sports center and then they would just re-air it all night so hmm. um it was 24 hours but it wasn't necessarily original programming 24 hours a day gotcha yeah and that makes a big difference when thinking about uh, back doing like play by play, actually, Nick, you have a quick question. Would you like to say something? Yeah. So um, I'm a huge baseball play by play guy. Um, actually, all sports. I actually, funny enough, wake up to uh, Joe Buck's call of um, the Minneapolis miracle. Anyway, um, so I assume that means you're a Vikings fan. No, I'm just a fan of the call. Oh, wow. Um, it, and it was an amazing call, right? It was. And so my question is actually about Joe Buck. You know, since I was a child, Joe Buck has been calling World Series games. And, you know, it, his call of the World Series has improved since the early 2000s and to, you know, from Cubs World Series on. But, you know, he's not one of the more interesting or, you know, passionate baseball announcers or like, you know, Matt, um, uh, I can't say his name. Um, Vescursion, thank you. Um, you, know where, you, know, you know what college Matt Vescursion went to? UCLA? No. Uh, USC? I, I'll just leave it at that. We're good. Ah, dang um, it. <laughs> so, you were, your, anyway, second guess, your second guess was right. <laughs> so, um, you know, why don't doesn't Fox or, um, you know, when they're calling the World Series, put someone who's really animated and is going to, you know, call Santa Maria and really like the excitement that he does when, because he called NLDS games and those were really exciting, but yet, you know, Joe Buck is a little bit more pulled back and it's not as exciting as a, a call of the World Series, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I, and that's fair. And, and uh, obviously, as we see, um, there are definitely people online that are not as, as big of fans of Joe as, as others. We, we think Joe is the best in the business, um, and we wouldn't have it any other way. He'll, he'll be calling the World Series as long as he works for us, hopefully, and he'll be calling the Super Bowl a, a year from February when we next have it in Arizona. And um, I, I, I think it's interesting. The criticism that Joe gets is from fans. I, I've never heard anyone that is in our business criticize Joe because he is at such a high level. And, and, and he has been criticized over the years about, um, about his excitement level. I, I think, um, I think he, uh, yeah, I just, I think he's the best at what he does. And I, I, I wouldn't think twice about, we don't, we don't think twice about putting him on the biggest events. Definitely. I mean, I, you know, I watch actually every last out, even if my team's on the world series to see what Joe's call is for that. I can, probably name all of them um, in the last 10 years. So definitely, definitely respect him. I just wonder, you know, the call behind who gets to make that decision. So, um, or who, who is on the, the, the broadcast team. So. Yeah. And, and, and Matt's worked for us for many years. Matt worked just called NFL games for us. It's called baseball games. Now locally is calling angel games. Uh, and uh, in addition to he's no longer going to be doing ESPN Sunday night baseball. He'll be doing it's splitting his time between MLB network and, uh, and, and he'll do, I think, about half the Angel games, 80-something games. And, and I, I, Matt is unbelievably talented and, is, and is, is definitely one of the best in the business and a really, really, really good guy. Awesome insights. Yeah, I, I personally, Joe Bug, I like a lot of his calls. And uh, last night, that was a great job. I'm curious, well, you just mentioned, um, 
I think it was Matt or something who's also doing some work with like the MLB network and stuff like that. Is it generally acceptable for people to kind of be doing work for multiple different uh, like media companies and things like that? Like, is it common or how's that kind of look? Yeah, it's, it's honestly shifted. It used to be, um, I would say, you know, 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago that you just kind of worked at one company and that was that. Um, I think as, uh, as salaries rose and it became more competitive, it really became a, a thing where um, working at multiple networks is more acceptable than it used to be. Um, you know, I would use the example of Alex Rodriguez, who's on the desk for our um, baseball pregame and postgame. You know, he also calls Sunday Night Baseball for ESPN. Uh, more and more people work for uh, various places just uh, to fill out the calendar, right? Or you, sometimes you can only get, uh, you can only offer so many things. And then, and then you have people, you know, I would use the example of Michael Strahan, who uh, works for us and is a big part of our, our football coverage, but during the week works on Good Morning America. And so more and more people are employed by more, multiple people and it's, it's become a more accepted part of our business. Interesting. That's really cool. I had no idea that uh, that was a thing. That's cool to hear. And thinking back to your USC days when you were doing play by play yourself, who were some of the announcers that you kind of modeled uh, your work after or looked up to? So um, uh, Chick Hearn was like uh, who I kind of grew up on. He was he was such a uh, he was the voice of the Lakers for many, many years and was kind of like you, you guys probably all know Vin Scully. Chick, Chick Hearn was basically Vin Scully, but on the basketball side. So, uh, you know, all of Magic Johnson's games and even when Kobe Bryant came into the league, it was called by Chick. So Chick was really kind of the guy I grew up with. Um, I'm also a hockey fan. Bob Miller was a, a great announcer for the Kings for many years. Um, we got spoiled in Los Angeles, to be honest with you. Uh, Vin, who I mentioned before, Dick Enberg, who was the voice of UCLA basketball, as well as the uh, Angels. Um, Tom Kelly, who was a longtime voice at USC, there were just a, a, an amazing group of iconic announcers in LA that were kind of the soundtrack of my childhood. And, um, very fortunate. I think now, I think what's cool is that you can kind of listen to everybody. Like it's a, it's a little less, it doesn't have to be just your local people. You can hear every game, you know, if, if you're a, uh, your, if your parents are Yankees fans or Mets fans or Red Sox fans, you know, you can watch the MLB extra innings package and listen to all those games. And um, so I think it's probably the local announcers are probably a little more national than they used to be. Um, I'd use the example of like um, John Chiambi, who calls the Cubs games and also games for ESPN is as good a baseball play by play guy as ever I've ever heard. And if you're a Cubs fan living in California, you can hear him if you, you know, you, you have access to those games, which is, which is a big shift. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everything's so accessible these days. And also in thinking about when you were doing some of those play-by-play -play stuff, what kind of preparation goes into that? And what would you say was like your favorite part of it? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of reading, a lot of memorization. You got to know um, people's, you know, jersey numbers, basic facts, where are they from? You have a, you have a board in front of you that lists kind of, you know, uh, hometowns and, and weights and heights. And then you just read as much as you can and have, hope to have some stories about it, as many players as you can. And, and you never know when the backup left tackle is going to come into the game and you want to have something on them or, you know, in particular, a backup quarterback, you know, uh, starting quarterbacks one hit away from being removed from the game. So you got to have stuff on him. So really, honestly, just immersing yourself in it. And, and I love sports anyway. So it, it, it kind of doesn't feel like work because you, you'd be studying and reading anyway. So it's uh, it's an excuse to do that and, and actually benefit the broadcast. Yeah, absolutely. And thinking back on that, too, like what was the craziest game? you've ever announced or even throughout your professional career ever been a part of even behind the scenes? Well, biz bizarrely, when I was in school, USC basketball was actually better than football, which sounds, it wow. sounds surreal. Um, when I was in school, Harold Miner was there. who's arguably the best player that ever played at USC in hoops. Uh, I was a sports illustrated um, player of the year, his junior year. We were a two seed and our basketball team was really good when I was in school. So there was a lot of, a lot of exciting games, upsets over Arizona and Ohio State. Um, 
classic matchups. Uh, Jimmy Jackson, who works for us in announcer, who was an unbelievable basketball player at Ohio State and, and then had, I think, about a 14-year career in the NBA before. Um, he now works for us and, and, and Turner calling basketball. But, I, but that Ohio State game where we upset them was, was a really big deal, and I, I, I still give him a little bit of a hard time about that. So more, more actually, bizarrely, more memorable basketball games and football games. But I was fortunate enough to go to – Penn State and Notre Dame, as well as the Rose Bowl, and you know, it's being some amazing venues calling games while I was in school. Oh wow, that sounds like some really incredible opportunities, especially for an undergraduate and stuff like that. Could you also maybe tell us a little bit uh, about what it's like to work at a Super Bowl? Because I know you've been a part of some very significant ones as well. Yeah, you know, honestly, there's to me, there's nothing more uh, special and rewarding than that. It's it's honestly, it's the center of the universe. Where would you rather be? And it's the pinnacle of of, of what sports television is. So, um, you know, we've had some amazing ones. Uh, we had um, the Patriots uh, beating the Falcons, coming back uh, from twenty down twenty eight to three and winning in overtime. We actually had the Giants and Eli Manning upsetting the Patriots. Uh, which ended the Patriots' perfect season. They were trying to become only the second team ever to have a perfect season. So, um, I, honestly, I, every Super Bowl is special. Uh, it's 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 the it's it's on it's a, by far the biggest thing in sports in our country, and 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 so much bigger than anything else on our planet. So, um, yeah, you just always tend to think of it as a privilege. Um, I'm I'm fortunate enough to work at a company where we have the rights to you know to broadcast Super Bowls, right? Yeah, absolutely. And those storylines too, it's real cool when they come together. And as you said, it's like the center of the universe. And then when you have a massive upset, like I, I should know, I'm a Patriots fan, but when the Giants beat uh, the Patriots and that undefeated run with the crazy catch on the helmet and all that, that was just absolutely fantastic for like any average viewer and things like that. Um, also, and thinking about when you were doing some play-by-play, -play, what were maybe some of the biggest things you learned from that? And then how has it been applied to the rest of your career, helping you behind the scenes when you're coaching up uh, on air talent? Yeah, I think you I think you see how difficult it is and how hard it is. And, you know, college football is particularly hard where you have, you know, 100 odd players on a team. You have some numbers that are duplicate that, that you know, sometimes multiple players have the same number which obviously doesn't happen in the NFL, doesn't happen in NBA or college basketball. Um, and, and, and when you kind of, when you know the challenges that are faced, I think that, I think that helps when you, you can get feedback. You've at least, you've been in that shoes, their shoes, not to the national degree, but you have, have called games and have a sense of uh, some of the difficulties they have. And, um, you know, it's bizarre in our industry in the, in the fact that uh, kind of the bigger you get, the higher level you get, the easier it gets. You have uh, better producers, you have better directors, you have stat guys that are better, you have spotters that are better. When you're calling a minor league sport or a lower level college game or even high school sports, you don't have that support system. So weirdly, when you get farther along, it, in some ways it becomes easier. Wow. Yeah, that is really cool. And what are some of the most important qualities for successful on-air professionals? Um, I, you know, I, I always say uh, you want to be conversational, you want to be entertaining, and you want to have credibility. So, um, you know, take, take the example of uh, maybe the most uh, prominent UCLA uh, football player, Troy Aikman, who works for us. You know, Troy's calling a game. He's got three Super Bowl rings, right? You're not going to question what he's saying. He's got an absurd amount of credibility. Um, and, and, you, you kind of want that in all of our announcers, you know, baseball, we have John Smoltz. Um, and, and you all, you also, the goal is it, it, you want it to be comfortable and, and it should be a conversation really the announcer, you should have a relationship with that person. It's, it's, they're talking to you. They're not talking at you. They're talking with you. It's really a conversation. And um, it's almost like if in a perfect world, if, if you were having a, a beer with that person, that would be, should be hopefully similar to what they are when they're calling the game. So hopefully um, the announcer uh, of your team, you have that relationship. You love, you love, call, you love hearing them. Um, Jerry Remy, who was a longtime broadcaster for the uh, Red Sox, just passed away. He had yeah. been battling cancer for a long time. And the reaction you saw from 
Red Sox fans was like losing a family member because he had that personal relationship with him. And, and, and that's, I, that's really what you hope for from your announcer that they're, they're really um, sitting there for, you know, three plus hours watching a game with you and talking with you, not at you. Yeah, absolutely. I like, I really like that idea of like, it would be someone you would have a beer with and things like that for people on the call who maybe, Unfortunately, I don't think there are any on here right now who are like Troy Aikman's of what we're doing at our sports or whatever. How do you go about establishing credibility if you don't have that background? Yeah, well, there, there's kind of two camps, right? There's the former athletes, but then there's the the play by play announcers or reporters. And at that point, if you're doing something like that, you need to immerse yourself if you're covering a team, whatever it is. If somebody is covering, uh, you know, the USC or the UCLA LSU game, they should know more about that game than anyone else on this planet. It, the announcers that we assigned to that game, we expect them to know more about that game than anyone else. So, um, I think the credibility comes from people just knowing it and 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 having the ability to be immersed in that game and, and, and not slip up and no name pronunciations, no facts about the players, we literally know everything about that game. And um, th that takes work, but it also takes, uh, it takes experience. It takes years of hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Work hard and good things will come of it. So that's nice to hear that there is a window to be able to get in, even if you don't have that Troy Aikman resume going for you, that's definitely uh, good to hear. I'm curious as well. You mentioned like, you know, play by play, uh, reporting, things like that. What are some of the biggest differences if you could walk us through like being the guy who hosts the pregame versus like Joe Buck and Troy Aikman versus Aaron Andrews on the sideline? Yeah. So kind of in our basic world um, there, you know, there's a studio side to things in TV, you know, so, so think pregame shows, think half times, post games, then also think shows during the week, like uh, the herd with Colin Coward, speak for yourself, NASCAR Race Hub, NFL Live on ESPN, Sports Center, um, and, and then there's the actual game. So it's you know a, a lot what we call a live event. So um, you know it, it, if you're watching the World Series last night, we have our studio show hosted by Kevin Burkhart with Alex Rodriguez, um, David Ortiz, and Frank Thomas. But then you have the game broadcast, which is Joe Buck. John Smoltz, and then in each covering each team is uh, Tom Verducci and Ken Rosenthal. So um, announcers kind of, for the most part, you have to almost kind of pick one one lane or the other. There are the rare exceptions like Kevin Burkhardt and Mike Tirico are good examples of guys that are great in studio and also great on games. But for the most part, if you're if you're Joe Buck, you do games. If you're Jim Nance, you do games. If you're Kurt Menefee, you host studio for us. If you're James Brown, you host studio. And 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 typically you kind of pick one side of those or the other. And and those those are kind of the 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 simplest delineations between our two worlds in our in our industry. Definitely. That is cool to see people like Mike Tarico and stuff like that being able to balance uh, both sides of studio and live event. You mentioned an important name, Kevin Burkhart there. Who well, I understand, you know, you were a large part of finding him and being able to spot that talent. Could you maybe walk us through how you go about finding talent and things like that? Cause I understand he was selling used cars and calling high school games at the time. Well, he was, so he was, he was based on the East coast. He's a New Jersey guy. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty funny story. So he was an aspiring broadcaster and, and, and doing it kind of at a low level and then just kind of got reached a, a kind of an end point where things weren't coming his, his way. So he, he started selling cars. And um, when he got the car job, he, uh, he told his boss, he said, Hey, you know, I really ultimately want to be a sports broadcaster. If there's any way I can kind of do that on the side, I'll do it at night. It won't interfere with my job. And the boss was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. And then he, he was calling, you know, games on, uh, you know, New York radio and his boss actually heard one and was like, Oh, wait a second. You weren't joking. You really are, are want to do call games. And um, then he even became more supportive of him. And um, I, I, I kind of came across Kevin a little bit later. He was, he was working as a sideline reporter for the New York Mets games. And one of our PR people had kind of tipped me off. They said, Hey, keep an eye on this Kevin Burkhardt. He's really special. And kind of from that point on, I just kind of kept a point on his career. And, um, and then we had an opportunity for him and we, we were able to bring him in and, 
Um, he calls uh, our second biggest NFL game each week now with Greg Olson, who just uh, retired last year. And then obviously the baseball studio, like we talked about with, uh, with A-Rod, Big Poppy, and, and Frank, Frank and Thomas. And then also we'll, we'll call some, uh, you know, college basketball for us in the year and is, is one of those r- rare and unique people that I don't know what she's better at, calling games or calling being a host in the studio. He's, he's equally great at both. And that's a, a very small list of people. You know, Mike Tirico, Bob Costas. There aren't many more beyond that. It's just it's it, it, the, the ability to do both is, you know, it's it's uh, there aren't a lot of human beings that can do both as well as they do. Yeah. So it sounds like for all of us, if you're able to have a lot of versatility in this space, you can find success. Yeah, you, what I what I recommend to people at your age and, and even, you know, as you get a little bit earlier or later in, in your career, or, you know, in your, your beginning in your career, the more you can do, the better, because um, a job comes along and you don't want to say, oh, I've never called a game before. Oh, I've never done highlights before. You don't want to ever say, no, I can't do that. You want to say, yeah, I've done that. I can do it even if you've done it once. So, uh, you know, if you have any uh, interest in broadcasting, I, I'm always the, the belief, the more you can do, the better off you're going to be in the long run. And um, the more different sports, you know, the more different roles you've done, it, it just, it, it, it just keeps that many doors open. Definitely. That's cool. Uh, Ryan uh, from uh, the group has a question for you, which says that he really enjoys watching women's sports, specifically women's basketball, both pro and college, yet coverage of these sports is pretty limited on major networks. And people argue that it's because no one wants to watch it, but we don't even know that because major networks haven't really given it a shot in terms of television. Uh, sorry, it is a bit of a long question, but it has good context. He says, according to one study from a couple of years ago, Fox Sports featured women's sports less than 1% of the time. It's curious how you guys plan on including women's sports in your coverage in the future and that how maybe consistent coverage could help build the fan bases. Yeah, I would, I would give the example of how we treat the women's world cup. We treat the women's world cup as prominently as we treat the men's world cup. And, and uh, the, the, the women's world cup final in 2015 where the U S won, that was the, that's the most watched soccer match in the history of the United States period. Don't have to qualify male, female, it's the most watched soccer match in the history of this country. So, um, I, yeah, I, I think there's always a need for more. And but that's a, a, a pretty stunning example of people are interested and um, it's finding the right sports. And, and I think that, you know, what, what we found is, uh, you know, after, you know, events like the Olympics and the World Cup, these big, huge national uh, international events. Um, I think all networks have struggled a little bit to get uh, a consistent viewership in, in, in female sports. And that's on all of us to keep, keep taking chances, keep broadcasting them and keep showcasing it. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, excitement in this, in this city, in, in LA for Angel City FC, the, 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 the uh, women's soccer team that's starting next year. And um, it, a lot of great people are involved with the team, some celebrities, Natalie Portman, one of the owners. Um, and, and I think it has a chance to be really special. So hopefully we can kind of just keep building on it. But um, I, I think we, I think it's shown when, when the situation's right, people will watch. And, and I think that 2015 women's world cup example is a huge, is a huge case study in it that um, it doesn't have to be men competing for viewers to watch. And hopefully we keep finding uh, opportunities that make sense. And hopefully we keep all uh, in our industry, developing and evolving as we go along, um, you know, and it's not just the women's sports. Uh, the, the, uh, the two people that have worked for Fox in the past, um, Lisa Byington and Kate Scott, who are uh, play-by-play announcers, are now voices of NBA teams. So um, Lisa Byington was uh, hired to be the voice of the Milwaukee Bucks, not just any other team, the defending NBA champions. And then Kate Scott is the voice of the Philadelphia 76ers. You know, there might not be a more uh, passionate set of fans than the, than the Philadelphia fans. So that's all just happened in the last few months that they got hired at the start of this NBA season. So um, I think it, it, the world will continue to evolve both in covering women's sports and having women cover men, uh, male sports. Yeah. And yeah, as you alluded to as well, that one, that's awesome to see. Uh, there's a woman doing the announcing for the Milwaukee Bucks, like you said, 
that's not just any other team, you know, our defending champs and all that. And then also the World Cup coverage uh, for the Women's World Cup, they've been crushing it, obviously, the last few years. And thinking a bit about, you know, some people on this call, we want to become future leaders like yourself. And in leadership, you have to coach people up. When doing that with your talent, how would you say you balance or, or find a balance between like positive affirmation and active criticism when you find an area that someone needs to improve? Yeah, I think it's both. I think, I think you know, you never want to be all positive and you want to never want to be all negative. So I think, um, yeah, you want, you want to give feedback both positively and negatively. So I, I, I think just like anything, I think people are going to respond better if, if you give them, here's five things, here's three you did well, here's two things you need to work on or vice versa. There's three things you didn't do was great, but here's at least two things you nailed. So I think it's a balance. Uh, you know, nobody's perfect and nobody's, uh, it does everything wrong. So can you give, can you give a balance in your feedback where you're, you're giving thing, constructive criticism and things to work on, but can you also reinforce some of the great things they're doing at the same time? Yeah. If you don't have me asking, what are some areas maybe that uh, you find some people needing to improve upon, like without naming names, of course, obviously, but just maybe areas that people are working on at the moment and just trying to get better at. Yeah, I think I think everybody has the issue um, when they're broadcasting, and, and and the younger you are, the harder it is to be conversational and and not keep in mind, oh no, there's a camera on me, right? That's that's a hard thing to just turn your mind off of it. There's a camera recording your you know your every every picture, every thought, um, and 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 a lot of times, especially with younger broadcasters. They want to talk like this because they think that's how you sound on TV. It's like, no, you want to do, you want to be conversational. And so it, it, it's almost, it's, it's finding your voice, right? So how do you, how do you find that voice and how do you get comfortable in your own skin, which is harder than it sounds? Yeah. So it sounds like authenticity is definitely a strong quality that when you can find it can take you far. Well, yeah, it's, it's huge. And, and I think you, go, all of you as viewers, you know, when something's authentic, right? Like I use, um, use the example of our NFL pregame show with Terry Bradshaw, Howie Long, Michael Strahan, Jimmy Johnson, hosted by Kurt Menefee, or, um, you know, TNT's NBA show with, uh, you know, with Ernie Johnson and Shaq and Charles Barkley and Kenny Smith. Those people love, like being around each other. They're friends. It feels authentic right it doesn't feel manufactured where they just got in the studio and, and pretend like they like each other for an hour these people really like each other and i i think viewers are smart enough to know the difference and i uh, i think that's what separates shows like that from uh most of what's on uh television the sports the sports television landscape yeah seeing that chemistry it definitely you can like feel it on the other side of the screen i think that's a really cool thing you pointed out there one of our other executive board members johnny dalsey uh, mentioned to me that he has a question for you. Johnny, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Colin. Um, and yeah, thank you, Jacob, so much for coming out and talking to us. My question was um, regarding, I know you had said uh, in a previous response that at working at a higher level, you have more access to advanced analytics and things like that to talk about during your broadcast. I was wondering if, you know, both as someone who has been on TV and you know working in the production whether you see like a future in specific airtime dedicated to talking about advanced analytics like programs where they had like statisticians on someone to talk about you know more advanced metrics than are usually discussed on TV the sort of things that like right now are really more discussed on like podcasts or in like people's blogs yeah I, um in my honest opinion I think it's it's kind of a secondary experience um I you know I, think of what uh the mannings are doing on monday night football think of uh you know an espn what they have done when they have uh, the national championship game and they have these the mega cast and there's other you know there there are broadcasts specifically that we've done baseball broadcasts that are kind of analytics driven mlb network has as well um i think there's a place time and a place for it i don't know that 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 is that there's enough of an audience and enough of a craving of it that that trumps just the normal broadcast. I think it can augment it for sure. Um, Cynthia Freeland at, uh, at the NFL Network is an example of somebody that looks at things from an analytic standpoint, and she is a huge part of their programming. So I think it's emerging that it's becoming a bigger part of things. Do I think it will ever over, overtake 
a, a normal broadcast. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, a casual fan who's a, a housewife in Iowa wants, wants to consume it that way. Um, I think what we're going to see is more options. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, um, uh, Gabe Kapler, who, who works for us as an announcer and, and kind of looked at things a little bit more analytically and a little bit more from that perspective. I think what he did for us on air helped him get a job as a manager with the Phillies. And now he had an unbelievable you know, year this year with the San Francisco Giants. So I think it's a part of our industry. I think it's a part of sports. Do I think it will be uh, overtake everything and be the, the number one prevailing pe way people watch sports? I don't. I could be wrong, but I do think there's a place for it. And I think that uh, it, it, it's almost a, a secondary way to watch games for, for those that are interested in, in listening to things and, and looking at it from that perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great question, Johnny. And also for context, guys, Johnny interned as uh, someone in the analytics department at the Atlanta Hawks last summer. So he's an absolute whiz when it comes to numbers and things like that and working hard. Um, and looking at the chat, Brent has a question here, which says that uh, he's curious how well Fox does in broadcasting those international events like the World Cup when competing, you know, with other international BBC, be in sports and every other nation out there having kind of their own networks. Yeah, you know, international tournaments like like, for instance, the Euros, where we just signed to the World Cup are very unique in that all the studio component of things we're producing. Um, but the actual games themselves are usually produced by a, a soccer federation. So the World Cup feed is actually done by FIFA. So what we we do and what the BBC does is is the same broadcast. Um, we depending on 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 the particular tournament, we might be able to put our graphics in. But sometimes you even just have to take their graphics. So there's a little less. Um, uh, I would say creativity and ability to put your own stamp on a broadcast and a little bit more, Hey, how do we make the studio show big? Like, you know, if we're in France, can we get a, you know, is there a distinct place? Like, can we get a backdrop with the, with the Eiffel tower behind us, whatever it may be, that's the part you can control the games themselves. Uh, you're a little bit, a little bit at the mercy of, of the soccer federations for the most part. And a lot of times that's the same case also with like the Olympics that there's one, uh, there's an international feed. You may be able to augment it with a couple of cameras, but for the most part, most people in the world are seeing the same, the same, uh, the same actual broadcast of the events. Wow. It's really insightful. I never knew that was the case actually. Yeah. Well, uh, I, if you're FIFA or the Olympic committee and you have that much money and that much control, sometimes you like to make sure you keep that control. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, we got another question here from Gavin, who says that seeing that you've been at Fox for the majority, well, pretty much all of your career, can you speak on the value of being loyal to one organization and what signs to look out for in terms of upward mobility outlook and things like that within a company, knowing whether it's good to stay or not? Yeah, you know, um, I've been very fortunate that I, I, I've been at Fox Sports since the summer between my junior and senior year of college. And that is not the norm. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the more time that goes on, the less likely that's the case. Um, I've been fortunate where I've kind of grown with the company. And, and as we talked about earlier, I work on Super Bowls. I've worked on World Series. I've worked on Daytona 500s. You know, you can't put a price on those kind of events like that. That's the pinnacle of what we do. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. Um, the one thing that uh, that I think is hard, and I, and I dealt with it too, is when you're the younger you are, the, I think the less patient you are. Um, so it's hard. There's been plenty of times where I was like frustrated Fox and I'm like, I'm not getting opportunities. And a lot of times it just, it's like the patience kind of pans out in the end. Um, somebody gave me great advice a long time ago that sometimes in your career, the best moves you'll make are by not making a move. Like I've had, I, I've had a lot of great job offers over the years, but for whatever reason, uh, my loyalty to Fox or the, the job was just, it didn't seem just right. I've stayed at Fox and sometimes that's the best move you can make is by just staying in place. You know, you, you invest time, you have relationships, you know how the company works. Um, there's a lot to be said uh, if you're at the right place for not necessarily looking for the next thing that, you know, I of a broadcaster I'm good friends with. And we met, you know, probably right before COVID. And she said, 
God, you know, I, I just really like my job. I just really like where I work. Is, is that bad? And I said, no, that's great. Like you work in a great place. You love your job. Like you don't always have to seek out the next big thing. Sometimes, you know, where you are and being loyal. Yeah. That, 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 that's the best alternative. Absolutely. Quite insightful with the, sometimes the best move is to not make any move at all. Definitely. Also something quite rare these days, just seeing that someone stay at a company and be loyal for so long. That's uh well, and it's not just that, not just me being loyal to Fox. It's Fox also being loyal to me. I, it's a, it's a two way street, right? Like, I, yeah. you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just put it on my shoulders. They, they have confidence. They give me opportunities, and um, they make it so I don't want to leave. So it's also, yeah, it's also finding a place where um, you feel comfortable, but they also treat you right. Yeah, definitely. What would you say differentiates Fox from all its competitors, you know, like ESPN and things like that? Yeah, you know, not having been at the other competitors, I can only speak so much. What, what I will say, and I, I hate to keep harping on it, we have these amazing events that are at the highest level, right? There's, there's nothing bigger than working on a Super Bowl, and we have those opportunities. So that, that's pretty special. I, I think what we do great is the the biggest events at with the most viewers at, 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 you know on such a big stage um uh what what we get what i get feedback on a lot is we we almost call it the fox sports family it feels a little bit less like a job and more like um you know a, a place Community. where you're around people you want to be around um you know joe buck uh got the pete roselle award at the pro football hall of fame this summer and and talked about working at Fox and um, was nice enough to mention me and some other people he works with in his speech. And he said, you know, I have bosses that I, I, I would just be as happy to have a drink with as talk about my job. And um, I think, I, I don't know that that's the norm everywhere. It, my feedback, it seems like that's not, that we are unique in that respect. Um, you know, I, I think we try to treat people as much like human beings as we can. And that doesn't necessarily happen everywhere. Um, I like, for instance, you, you talked earlier about announcers working at different places and people also get like endorsement opportunities. And our answer is when somebody comes with us with another opportunity, the answer is yes. How do we get to yes, right? It starts at yes. And how do you work that way? You don't ever want to stand in the way if you can avoid it of people having a way to make a little bit more money, another opportunity, something that could be good for their brand. So you start at yes rather than start at no. Some places I think start at no, absolutely not, and maybe work to a yes. I think we actually start at a yes and hopefully are able to stay at a yes. That definitely sounds like an attractive quality, especially for people of talent where they're getting opportunities like that and stuff. And also I'm thinking about this too, because I remember being at a uh, West Coast Sports Associates, a uh, little social a couple months back with Mark Sanchez uh, when you brought him in and him speaking to the fact that I think Fox is renowned sort of too for helping prepare its talent to actually be on air. Like that sometimes you don't find that at other places. Could you maybe walk us through what it's like uh, preparing someone like Mark, who was just playing a few years ago to like, Hey, now you're on like the red buttons on you're live. You're in front of millions. How do you guys get them prepared for that? Yeah. So I would deal with the example of Mark. You know, we, we, we first auditioned him three years ago. Um, we, he didn't, he didn't, we didn't end up hiring him. He ended up actually going to ESPN, but we kept in touch. And then once we kind of gave him another audition this year, this, this past spring, and it went great and we hired him, we had a, had a producer work with him and, and they did, you know, mock games and, and rehearsal games and, and got prepared. And you, you, you want to do as much as you can to put people in a position to succeed. Um, I would use the example of Michael Strahan, who was who was working for us when he was still playing with the Giants. We would he would do pre, pre features for us in the pregame. In the summer he would come in the studio. Same with Greg Olson, who did games for us in his bye weeks, did games XFL games uh, when that league existed while he was still playing and got those reps. So, um, you know, this is Greg's first year of doing games, yet he feels extremely polished because. Um, you know, he put himself in a position where he was committed to it and want to do the work. And then we put him in a position to give him the resources. So he really could learn how to do the job even before he had the job. Yeah, that definitely sounds like it goes a long way, especially getting to do those practice runs and things like that. And one thing when I was playing football here at UCLA and some of the guys here can probably uh, recognize as well is 
Coach Kelly likes to preach about, you know, if you make practice harder than the game itself, then the game feels easy. And so if you're able to do that, then, you know, getting on air, that's nothing. You've already been there, done that, if not done harder stuff. That's so. a perfect way to look at it. Like, um, yeah, the, the more, and it was kind of what I said earlier, when the, the higher level you get, you have, you know, better producers, better directors, you have better stat people, you have better spotters. So bizarrely, when you're doing a game at a higher level with a lot more viewers, in some ways it's actually easier, which it says a lot. It's not, not, not so different than Chip's philosophy about practice. Yeah, definitely. We also have a question in the chat from uh, Tom, one of our other executive board members who helps run our website. He says that we're seeing overall there's a viewership decline with the younger audiences for traditional sports. And he's curious if there's any plan of action or anything on Fox's behalf to try and recapture this audience or maybe even try out other forms of streaming Fox's games and programs. Yeah, so you know we have a big streaming component on our digital on our digital site and our website. Um, we we don't have as uh, you know the uh, the other kind of our counterparts uh, in the NFL side. ESPN has ESPN Plus, uh, NBC has Peacock, um, uh, CBS has Paramount Plus. They have kind of these built-in streaming uh, uh, platforms, which are big parts of their philosophy. We own Tubi which uh, is interesting in that Tubi actually does not require a monthly subscription. Um, so that's, that's a priority. And in, in all of our new deals, all, all the new NFL deals kick in um, after next season. So in 2023, there are the ability to, to stream games on our streaming platforms. That's all in all a carve out in all of our contracts. So um, yeah, you, 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 you want to go where people are going to be. And, and, and obviously we're headed towards that world. Um, you know, but the, I, I would say the, the unique thing about the NFL is there's still more people watching TV than watching any other platform. So if, you, if you'll notice, I would, I, the NFL, when they just did their new deals, they still kept television as their biggest priority uh, and network television, you know, CBS, uh, NBC, Fox, and even ESPN is using more of an emphasis on ABC, which Disney also owns. Um, and, and I think it, 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 it shows that, that the biggest league and, the, and frankly, the biggest television property in our country still recognizes the, the value of broadcast television and, and the amount of people who can watch. And, and, and you will augment that with streaming, but, but regular TV still hasn't gone away. Um, and yeah, the challenge is getting you know, people your age to consume our media. Yeah. It'll definitely be interesting to see the day, and maybe it's already happened when sports bars, instead of flipping through DirecTV or Tom Warner Cable, or using their Roku remote or something to flip between ESPN. Yeah, but I, I think I think you just actually, and it's a problem that you know bars and restaurants aren't set up to do that. Will they be at some point? I'm sure they will be, but we're not quite there yet. And that's a lot of discussions happening about NFL Sunday Ticket. You know, the ability to watch all your games, all the NFL games, which is now part of DirecTV, and there's lots of talk of that's going to end up in a stream, on a streaming platform. There's also lots of talk that the NFL still wants to have a deal with DirecTV to, to really cater to that bar restaurant audience that shows all the games on a Sunday and doesn't have the infrastructure to have, uh, you know, 30 TVs that are streaming. They, they're, they're already set up to, ha you know, have a cable, cable or satellite provider. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I'm curious as well, too. What are some of the biggest risks you've taken with regards to like on-air productions and how, how have they gone? Uh, biggest risks. So, yeah, I mean, I would think, you know, there, there, there's, there's different little things and, and there are various levels of risk. Um, you know, we had the, we had the field of dreams game last July on baseball. We actually have a NASCAR uh, race at, at the Coliseum this February. Um, we, we've experimented with different cameras. We, we, there's one that we call the Megalodon that almost creates a little bit of a video game focus. And it's become kind of the biggest thing in sports that our technical group led by Mike Davis is, is, is launched. So I, I would say rather than um, huge risks, I think it, where we are as a company and uh, at network television, I think you're less in a place to take huge risks but you take risks alongside of what you do on a regular basis. So, um, you know, 
there's an element of risk, but there's also um, a lot. A lot of times, the risks take place uh, at, at different, you know, at at, at, at at lower levels. Like, you know, the one of the one of the biggest changes in in recent times and kind of your lifetimes to uh, to the way we broadcast football is we added the cable cam, and the cable cam came out of the original XFL um, about 20 years ago, and and that was something that stuck. And and got samples in you know in 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 a in, in a less risky environment. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to be respectful of your time, as we know you got a dinner coming up. So I'm just going to ask a couple more questions here, if that's all right. Yeah, no problem. Which is that you know, considering tomorrow you got the Thursday night football broadcast, could you walk us through what your day is going to look like and what it's going to look like for the honor talent like Troy, Joe, and the uh, sideline reporters and stuff. Yeah, a week ago we had Packers Cardinals uh, with a combined one loss. Tomorrow we have Jets Colts, uh, more than one loss between them. So yes, it, uh, <laughs> things change in a week. Um, uh, you know, we two different examples. Last week I was actually in Arizona for the game. Tomorrow I'll actually be in our studio in LA, which is in Century City, not not so far from Westwood. Um, mm -hmm. We have a two p.m. production meeting for our announcers tomorrow. Uh, we'll come on the air at 4.30, so we'll start rehearsing probably about 3.30, do a full rehearsal of the show, and then we're on the air at 4.30. Uh, then the, the group, the, the studio group will also do halftime and then the post game afterwards. Uh, whereas the game announcers, you know, they'll probably get to the stadium around 2 o'clock uh, for a 4.30 Pacific time kickoff, or, or we're on the air at 4.30. They'll have a couple things they'll do for the pregame show game itself actually kicks off at 520 Pacific time, uh, 820 Indianapolis time. Um, and, and a lot of that is preparation. You know, they, they're, uh, th there's a rehearsal component, but during the week they, they've been studying, watching film of the team's previous games, what, reading articles, uh, teams put out press releases, just immersing themselves and, and, and knowing uh, hopefully more about that, uh, about the Jets Colts games than anybody else on the planet tomorrow. And hopefully that comes out on air tomorrow, tomorrow night. Yeah. Well, we'll be looking forward to it. That's for sure. And it'll be cool now kind of knowing what went into all that, you know, from a behind the scenes perspective and whatnot. And also it sounds like that's an area too, where, as you said earlier, the higher up you go kind of the easier it becomes. I assume when you're, you know, doing the low lower level regional stuff you got to do all that research pretty much by yourself or maybe an intern or assistant or something like that but i assume these guys have full teams that are helping them with that that's absolutely right they have they have great resources we we try to put them in a place to succeed and um surround them with great research great staff people best production people in the business and um and hopefully a lot of times especially as you get later in the year these are teams that they've actually seen earlier in the year so they have a, they have you know a handle a little bit on on what they what they've been doing you know this is an thursday night football we get a mix of afc and nfc games we're really we're really the network of the nfc so Jets Colts is not in our wheelhouse, but I would say like Packers Cardinals really is, you know, they, 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 they Joe and Troy and Aaron saw, you know, week one, they had, they had the Packers Saints game and Packers are a team we'll see regularly. Cowboys are a team we'll see regularly. So when you get some of those games with the more familiar matchups, they're going to be that much more prepared because they know the teams already. Yeah. That's quite an interesting observation. I, I had noticed that also too, you know, that you guys are generally doing more NFC and I guess CBS is doing more a AFC uh, for the time being. That's exactly definitely, right. Definitely interesting. And I guess, you know, last question of the night would just be, would you have any final uh, parting thoughts or action steps that we should take with us to keep mind moving forward, especially for those interested in sports media? Yeah. I mean, I think that the amazing thing that you guys have advantage of is there's information out there, right? If you want to know about our industry, you know, there's people you can follow and read on Twitter. Uh, you know, there's sports media reporters like John Oran, Andrew Marchand, uh, Richard Deitch, Jimmy Trana, these people, and they also do podcasts. They can subscribe to their podcast. Like there's so much information and so much ability to learn about our industry, you know, and if it's more on the business side, there's components of that, you know, sports business daily sports business journal. Um, take advantage. If, if what you want to be is, is sports, 
there's so much information out there. Immerse yourself in it. Learn about it. You should, you, you have the, uh, it's almost like an advantage that you have access to all this information and can know as much as anybody in the business because it's, it's at your fingertips. So, um, uh, you know, once you uh, take this next step, once you're out of school and, and work somewhere, you should know more about that company and more about whatever that industry and sports that they cover or they, they're involved in. You have the ability to know as much as somebody that's been there. You don't have the day-to-day -day practical experience, but you can know the industry as well as anybody there. Yeah. Thank you so much for all that and for the candidness. And uh, definitely, it sounds like we all should definitely immerse ourselves in any and all information out there that we can find on this. And I will say, although you're a Trojan, we are very grateful for you joining us tonight and for sharing all this information with us. It's really, it's worth its weight in gold. And I'm curious uh, as you leave, do you view the Bruins at all in a slightly more positive light after tonight? I know this was your first meeting with the UCLA group. Well, Mike's got a, he's got a, he's got a UCLA sweatshirt staring me right in the face. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then you and Tom have your virtual background. So yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm good with you Bruins. I don't know that I'm good with all Bruins, but keep in mind, where did Troy Aikman go to college? Westwood, man. Well, he, but he, actually, he originally went to Oklahoma. He transferred to UCLA. Yeah, he did. But we also have Eric Karos, one of our baseball announcers. We, we're, there, there are some Bruins in the company. So uh, there, there are lots of good Bruins, just like there's lots of good Trojans and just like there's lots of bad Trojans and lots of bad Bruins. So we, we, there's good in all of us. There's, there, there's a mix of good and bad in all of us. And we're, uh, we're, it, it's pretty unique that we're in, in a city where we can have two uh, world-class universities. There aren't many places on the planet that have that. Couldn't have said it better myself, and uh, hopefully it's a good one in a few weeks, and we go into the Coliseum and, and make it a tough day for you guys. But Take that victory bell back, right? That's that's the goal. That's the goal. So, <laughs> Thank you guys for inviting me, and I appreciate you guys, uh, guys asking questions and being around, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jacob. Take care. Appreciate it. All right, bye-bye. For the rest of us, we'll hang on here real quick just to go over a couple of announcements. Uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up real briefly. Thanks again for joining tonight. Uh, so real quick, you guys have seen it the last few weeks. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but there is an opportunity if you want to volunteer and, and keep building out that resume in our athletics department, you can join their athletics communications team. There's a QR code right there if you want to find the application. It is on a rolling basis, so it's going to close when filled. If you have any other further questions, please feel free to reach out to me, all right? A uh, quick reminder of our attendance policy as well. It's all merit-based. So when you come to meetings, we mark you down for two points. If you repost with a tag to help get the word out about our club, that's one point. If you meet with a board member, that's two points. And then anytime you help procure a speaker, like a cool one like tonight, Jacob Bowman, that's worth 10 points. And all these points can add up for when there are more limited opportunities. Like I mentioned, going to a West Coast Sports Associates social earlier where I got to meet Mark Sanchez and actually Nick Khan joined me for that too. People with the most points are generally going to be the ones getting invites to cool opportunities like that. Uh, so real quick, looking at our next play, same time next week, 6 p.m. on Zoom, we're going to be hosting the stadium announcer for the L.A. Rams, Sam Lagana. For those of you who have been to SoFi Stadium or ever heard him, he's the one saying, whose house? Rams house. So we're pretty pumped about that. He's also the CEO and president of Notre Dame High School, which was one of my rivals uh, back when I went to Loyola High School. And so we're very much looking forward to that meeting next week. And without further ado, thank you all for joining tonight. We really appreciate it and hope to see you back next week. Mm -hmm.